Well, thank you, Young, and uh, thanks to all the organizers for bringing us together. So first I'd like to start by uh, saying that uh, I'm a young user of resurgence and uh, I find uh, this theory totally fascinating. So to me it's like a piece of magic from 21st century that fell in the 20th century. And uh, uh, therefore I want to first uh, thank all the founding fathers, Professor Kahl, for developing this theory, for originating it. And uh, I hope this modest contribution will be uh, application of resurgence. So in this sense, this talk is applied resurgence. In the course of the talk, I'll try to uh, give you both conceptual piece of content, uh, food for thought, and that will be probably main part because uh, these will be questions that I don't know how to address, so I'm hoping some of, the, some of you in the audience will see the pattern or the structure or deeper reasons for it. And then I'll give you uh, also computational content. This is actually my territory. I like to compute things. And in the end, I'll try to explain how to compute uh, expressions like this. So the end result will be a Q-series with integer powers, integer coefficients, and lots of other cool structure that's useful A in topology and B for studying modular properties, modular forms, for example, Typical Q-series development is uh, reminding you of modular properties or modular forms. And the function on the board is uh, one of the outcomes. Again, I'll try to explain where it comes from, how it comes about. Uh, but I'll generate this as a Q-series so I can write arbitrary many <coughs> terms in the Q-expansion. Uh, but I don't know what this function is. And therefore, one question to the audience, that's already <coughs> your first homework, is if can anybody help recognize this function? Is it a Q hypergeometric series? Is it a num sum? What kind of gadget it is? So I give you first 20 terms in case you already guessed what it is or as a check. <laughs> You already have an answer, it seems like you're a little... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it has a name, right, but I want to kind of <laughs> close form in the sense of sum over m and then write uh, some clo closed form expression. And I don't know this, I'm, I'm honest, I'm not joking, but there is a way to generate it up to any order. And uh, as a test, uh, so first 20 terms may or may not be enough. Uh, if you can email me or look a recent paper with Manolescu, you can find how to generate these things. So again, uh, in the end, I'll, I'll explain. And uh, I give uh, some later terms just as a cross check or so you can determine. It. And indeed, as Maxim points out, it's, uh, it has a name. So we, we would naturally call it uh, analog of Kamsevich Zagir function, uh, which uh, originally was something, again, I wasn't present. In fact, I wasn't in the field yet at the time when Maxim introduced it. And Don um, uh, loved this function. So he called Maxim's identity a strange identity, which they explored. And that function naturally applies to trefoil knot, which we may encounter later today. And uh, this thing is supposed to be analog for a closed manifold, namely hyperbolic manifold produced from a figure eight knot. So, and again, my goal is to teach you how to produce such Kansevich Zagir type functions um, in, um, in greater generality. Uh, so this will be some topological applications, some modular applications, but again, I want to put it in a broader context and uh, the central theme of this uh, talk, therefore, so starting with conceptual things before you lose me in details, is that <coughs> we'll go from non-integers to integers. And again, main question will be why, why this happens. So the typical setup in which as a user I apply resurgence is where we start with some perturbative series in coupling constant that I'll call H bar. This is a formal power series with zero radius of convergence. <coughs> we do Borel transform, so that will be BZ perturbative as a function on a Borel plane and that variable I'll call Xi, so that's a Borel plane variable. And from there, another step is to do inverse Borel transform or produce something with better analytic properties but the same asymptotics as the original series. And this gadget in this talk We'll call, we'll call that hat. In topology, it has a precise meaning, so it's a very specific function, but in the first part of the talk, I want to, I want to use this just as a name and, and uh, view it a little bit more broadly. So the perturbative thing uh, for us uh, will be sum over m 
a m h bar to the m, where main property is that this perturbative coefficient a m will not necessarily be integer. That's actually a typical case in many problems I'll consider today. So this is where rational stands for. I mean, where we start with non-integers. On the Borel plane, but huh? But uh, let's assume they're rational. This is not important. In fact, there will be examples where they're not even rational, but al in algebraic number fields. But the miracles will be happening kind of in stages. So uh, on the Borel plane, this uh, usual Borel transform for uh, users like me is basically taking this perturbative coefficients and dividing by gamma. If m is integer, I can write just factorial. If it's a little bit shifted from integer, say integer plus a half, then gamma is a better way to do it, and we put psi to the m. So that's another series. And then, of course, uh, on the Borel plane, we ask, OK, what are the analytic properties of this function, and analyze it, and, and then go back. But the miracle uh, for me will be that after the dust settles, and we do this procedure, go to Borel plane and back, the result here will be of the form up to some overall power of q, which may not be integer power. This will be actually power series with integer powers and integer coefficients. So the result will look kind of like that. So what's q and h bar? Very good. So q and h bar, I was going to say that next, where q is exponential of h bar. And this will be one of the central equations in the entire talk. And to those of you who are familiar with enumerative problems, uh, I want to point out that this is very similar as in gromov witten versus Donaldson-Thomas theory. If you have gromov witten invariants and Donaldson-Thomas invariants of a calabi yau threefold, they're actually related in a very similar way and share many similar properties. That gromov witten invariants are typically rational because there are stabilizers. Donaldson-Thomas invariants are integers. And this is not a joke or not an analogy. It will be true in context that we're going to discuss today. And therefore, this relation, which is also standard relation between <laughs> parameter, which is producing generating function of gromov witten invariance h bar, and q, which is used in Donaldson-Thomas series, is exactly the same as, as here, and for a good reason. OK. Any questions? Sorry, I, I'm upset because it, when h bar goes to zero, q goes to one, so all terms are, are of the same order in yeah. your series. Exactly, and uh, that's, that's precisely, unfortunately or fortunately, that's the kind of applications where I'll need it. So that's a great question. So indeed, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, at least in problems that we encounter in topology and modularity in, in this talk, what will happen is that uh, natural expansion point uh, for Q series is, of course, Q equals 0, whereas natural expansion in terms of H bar uh, is around this point, where Q equals exponential of H bar goes to 1. And the reason it has something to do with Kansevich the gear is that there are analogous limits in various other rational points, where, as Maxim pointed out, for that original Kansevich function, some miracles happen. So indeed, uh, the goal for me will be transferring information from this domain near q equals 0 to this domain near q equals 1 and asking why certain things happen. In particular, asking why do we get integer coefficients in a very large class of problem. The integrality emerges, and that's the integrality, out of thin air. So that's pretty cool. I'm not an expert on resurgence, but I suspect that some part of explanation has to do with structure of this uh, B of the perturbative on a Borel plane. And then the natural question is, can somebody produce conditions under which this is supposed to happen? So again, I don't know full answer to either of these questions, but I'll try to say a little bit what we believe is responsible for integrality emerging out of nothing. So that's, that's the main point. <coughs> and this error from gromov witten to Donaldson-Thomas, do you have Borel resonations somewhere? So at the present day, I think about going from gromov witten to Donaldson-Thomas yes. as 
as, as a yeah, analogous phenomenon. It's a change of coordinates, no integral transformation here yeah. from G to G but right, it's, it's the same type of phenomenon so and again I want to use this not just as analogy as a very specific tool okay so this is fun uh, again integrality out of thin air but then uh, just to make it even more fun I want you to think about the following problem let's start and go the other way so from integers to non-integers so this is actually not so uh, complicated and mysterious. So we know that 1 plus 2 plus 3 is integer. So we start with integers, do something with them, and get integers. That's not very surprising. But how about 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on? What does it equal to? Thank you. And that's a non-integer. That's a rational number. <laughs> right? It just overshoots infinity by a little bit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, therefore, we'll encounter both phenomena where we go from non-integers to integers. That, of course, is more fun. But also, what's important is that in explaining this, what will be playing a role is this kind of phenomena, where you go from integers to non-integers. And let me explain that in the next uh, half an hour or so. Suppose you have a system with a phase space. Uh, in quantum field theory, this could be field space. <coughs> that via some Morse function or action function, you can project to the Borel plane. So Borel plane is basically a plane of values of that. So that's our psi. That's plane of values of the action. <coughs> and then on a Borel plane, we pay attention to singularities or poles. Um, so I'll give them name, say, alpha and beta. And then we integrate over corresponding rays, R plus, copies of R plus, starting at a given critical point, which are images of uh, stationary points in the phase space or field space where fields or variables satisfy equations of motion. And this rays, or copies of R plus, represent uh, cycles of steepest descent spent by trajectories of steepest descent, sometimes called Lefschetz symbols, in the <coughs> field space or phase space. So the phenomenon that often happens in this situation, or interesting phenomenon that happens, is when we change some parameters, or even if we don't change parameters, but we want to know how much this stationary point beta contributes to this integral when we do alpha. Uh, either way, if you think about tilting this, this ray, what may happen is that uh, it will go through the pole of through the singularity of the other critical point, alpha and beta. And as a result, <coughs> expression for integral will change. And uh, the typical way to describe this is to say that in the phase space or field space, integration cycle gamma alpha will change by the amount which is proportional to integration cycle beta with coefficient which in various contexts could be loosely called either Stokes coefficient or trans-series coefficient. And the basic point is that when this picture holds true, n alpha beta are always integer. Remember, this talk is all about rationals versus integers. And second thing that holds true is that n alpha beta in absolute value is always equal to n beta alpha. Because in the standard picard lefschetz theory, n alpha beta is interpreted as intersection number of cycles gamma alpha gamma beta. And if al gamma alpha intersects gamma beta, then of course the opposite is also true. So as a result, up to a sign, which has to do with possible choices of orientation, they have to be the same. 
And it's clear that intersection number counts intersection points, so it has to be integer. Important thing, and this is, again, I don't know full deep reason of this, but for this phenomenon to happen, to get something nice and modular and having good meaning in topology, both of these will have to be violated. And the reason it happens is precisely this. If you take a couple of integers and sum them up, the answer is integer. But if you take infinitely many integers and sum them up, you're going to get rational. And this happens, as we observe uh, in this concrete framework in a paper with um, Marcus and Pavel Putrov, is that in class of problems where there are infinitely many saddles, where each saddle point alpha is replicated infinitely many times, so alpha has its images, alpha prime, alpha double prime, and so on, so there is a whole tower and each critical point is replicated infinitely many times, that's where this happens. That's where this becomes a generic phenomenon. So are you thinking of finite dimension? <clears throat> uh, so I'll, I'll tell you, so very good. Next I'll address question, when does this happen? So what is this kind of class of problems? But we feel that this is crucial namely this way of going from integers to non-integers, where transserious coefficients are non-integer and are no longer symmetric, this will be playing a crucial role for phenomena of this type. Again, I think there is something much deeper going on. It's definitely above my pay grade. And because I don't fully understand this deeper reasons, I want to be crystal clear about little things that, that we do understand. So that's why I want to stress so much integrality versus rationality and vice versa. <coughs> so what is this class of problems where this picture on the right side of the board is realized. When, when, it, when is it relevant? <coughs> so class of problems have infinitely or infinite uh, towers, let me call them towers, of uh, saddle points. Where each critical point, saddle point, comes in multiple infinite copies, which I'll call towers. So the list is going to be quite long. And there are many ways to realize this structure, and uh, it appears in many different problems. Luckily, <laughs> the context which we encountered in that paper with Marcus and Pavel actually was the context where all of the five that I'm going to list for you are realized at the same time. So all the descriptions apply. So first of all, such problems include problems that uh, can be described by a spectral curve in C star cross C star. So it's important that it's punctured plane for both variables. Such a curve, let me call the polynomial equation A of x, y. So it will be given by polynomial in x and y. <coughs> but the corresponding symplectic form with respect to which I'll want to view this, or holomorphic symplectic form, will be dx over x wedge dy over y. And I want to contrast this with a class of problems where we look at the spectral curve in C cross C and use dx wedge dy as a symplectic form. So here, there'll be several things going on, and one of them is the fact that this space is not simply connected and there are windings. So if you start with this class of problems, and we form WKB analysis, you quickly find that what we call Z perturbative <coughs> as a function of H bar will start at life, of course, as 
exponential of 1 over h bar integral of log y, where you solve y in terms of x using this polynomial relation, and integrate dx over x. That's a Liouville form for this symplectic form. But what's important is that in this class of problems, <coughs> because if y is a solution to polynomial equation, log of y is logarithmic. Once you integrate it yet another time, you get dialogues, and this exponential of dialogues is not going to be a single-valued function. It's going to be a multi-valued function, and therefore, each critical point of this multi-valued function will necessarily generate exactly these kind of towers of uh, saddle points. Uh, excuse me, are you thinking, for instance, of a, of a potential which would be a trigonometric polynomial? No. Uh, Could that be... A, what do you call by potential? No, it's, it's, really it's, it's, some it's not some differential equation at all. Yeah, okay, it's, yeah. It's good equations. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Exactly, thank you. So in fact, that's another name for this kind of class of problems, that instead of differential equation, which would be the case in C cross C, this leads to Q difference equation. <coughs> Indeed, because uh, this uh, symplectic form, thank you very much, Maxim, implies that in a quantum world, if I introduce uh, quantization of this space, I'll have operators, maybe let me put hats on, on everything, y hat x hat is q time, times x hat y hat, and as a result, this equation is indeed a q difference equation. So that's, that's the crucial difference, and <coughs> then of course we can use various other tools to compute higher order terms, so we can generate this zp attributive of h bar in systematic way, so for example, uh, topological recursion, is a cool tool to apply it. And in this class of problems, which in fact I'll describe later, where A is some A polynomial, uh, this is what we studied with Piotr Sukowski. Also at that time, trying to shed light on integrality, but again, we didn't understand uh, as much as I'll try to tell you. Well, what to carry in integration? <coughs> uh, what's the integration contour? Uh, over over path, over path on this a polynomial curve. So it's a curve in C star cross C star, which looks kind of like this. So this, that's a contour. Uh, that is a cartoon for, for the curve. And you want to integrate so from some reference point, which you can call zero, to a critical point alpha. But the point I'm trying to make is that because things are not simply connected, there are all these windings, and they correspond precisely to the various branches of these dialogues. So that's the phenomenon which is absolutely crucial here, it seems. Huh? The critical points are fixed. You sum over all critical points or what? Uh, well, because... The fixed one. No, no, I, at, at the, right, uh, like I said, I don't know what's the right kind of prescription, but the problem that's being solved uh, is uh, this. I'm going to erase it in a second, but the point is you start with one critical point, you want to perform this process of Borel resummation resurgence. And usually what happens is that you get contributions from some other critical points to perturbative expansion of a given one alpha. But what I'm saying is that when you have each critical point is replicated infinitely many times, even if you start with a given alpha, you get contribution from infinitely many betas yeah, or their images. It's not like in Ekan uh, pointed out at the very beginning of his work that you consider the Riemann surface of the function and then you are all discrete and isolated and then you can just repeat the Lefschet Stimbo thing without having this infinite numbers of, of critical mm -hmm. values because they all belong to very different uh, sheets of your uh, issue when you can speak. Well, here uh, they all contribute with the same, exactly same action. So the feature is that because you exponentiate, all these critical points, all the images of the beta will have exactly the same value of the Morse function. I don't see, at least in physics context, how to separate them. And as a result, they all contribute exactly the same. We have to be democratic to our children, and here we have infinitely many children. <laughs> In, uh, the betas are all equal. So therefore, I cannot just say, oh, let me take contribution of these two guys because I like them. It's not fair. Okay, now next question is, how do I pull this blackboard down? Huh? Yeah, exactly. 
Like this? Aha. Uh -huh. That was very tricky. Okay. Okay, so where else do we see this kind of phenomena? So that was number one. Number two is uh, trigonometric. or hyperbolic, both names are used in the literature, integrable systems. Where variables are exponentiated and we use Q difference equations, uh, which is the Baxter equation, as opposed to rational integrable systems where H bar and unexponentiated variables are more natural variables in a phase space. Another application, uh, which I already mentioned, is open topological strings. Which is another class of problems with precisely this exponentiated behavior where each critical point is replicated infinitely many times with exactly the same value of multi-valued Morse function. <coughs> and in this case, uh, this perturbative series with which we start the original program before we apply resurgence is indeed generating function of Gromov-Witten invariance. And important point is that Gromov-Witten invariance are rational numbers, which is very well known in fact, clearly explained in early works of Maxim with Yuri Manin <coughs> due to stabilizers in theory of stable maps. <coughs> Another phenomenon, uh, which is actually more interesting, and that's where um, Marcus I and Pavel encountered it, is the context of gauge theory in dimensions greater than three, three or four. And here the point is that um, in such dimensions above two, gauge theory is really a theory in, in the sense that in two dimensions and lower, gauge field can be always replaced by scalars or fermions, but in higher dimensions, they really are quotienting the space of fields because gauge transformations are not symmetries, they are equivalences. And as a result, the space of gauge connections on any three manifold or four manifold is not simply connected because if you take space of such gauge connections, namely the phase space, and then impose gauge equivalence, what you're essentially doing, you're taking your phase space and curling it up so that you're creating a non-trivial fundamental group. So for example, in three dimensions, this becomes Z, and this fact, which may sound funny, is why we actually have instantons in four dimensions, and that's why in three dimensions Schoen-Simons function is only defined module integers, or 2 pi times integers, depending how you normalize. In other words, the cartoon is such that if you have a critical point alpha in your phase space <coughs> and critical point beta, because now this space is not simply connected, you have all kinds of findings and that's why your Morse function becomes multivalued. In the context of supersymmetric gauge theory, this phenomenon shows up by solving equations which normally would be minima some superpotential, but in this context, it's minima of exponentiated derivative of superpotential, which is written in terms of logs. So same thing, <coughs> logarithmic variables versus exponentiated variables. So that's another typical equation dw d log x appearing in the exponential which has to be solved in order to find critical points 
for example, in three-dimensional n equals two theory, which is under 3D, 3D correspondence is dual to some 3D transhumance theory. So you can see this phenomenon in multiple different ways. <coughs> Here, if this W, landau ginzburg type potential is, for example, integer times log of x squared, its derivative with respect to log x is going to give you um, just log x exponentiated that you're going to get x to some power equals 1. But again, point is that in this class of problems, x, just as above, takes values in c star, and therefore it gives you whole tower of solutions, I mean whole tower of critical points. So therefore, naively, what you have to do, you have to either sum over infinitely many Lefschetz symbols. I don't know how to do it. I don't have homological tools under my belt to, to do it. Or you do resurgence where you just sum infinitely many poles. That's totally OK. We can sum infinitely many numbers to regularize them to non-integers. So that's what appears here. And now I'm going to erase this magic formula, which is, again, responsible for everything else I'm telling you today. <coughs> So, number five, there are many more problems where this happens. And number six is, um, if more <laughs> right, and, and number six is uh, it happens in the context of complex transhumance theory, which under various dualities can be mapped into all these descriptions I mentioned. So actually all of the Complexified or holomorphic? Uh, holomorphic, with complex gauge group. So it's transignment theory where fields formally uh, are valued in complex groups such as SL2C. But there is no holomorphic, anti-holomorphic sector, there is no complex conjugation. Two so just... Huh? Two-dimensional. Three-dimensional. Three Three-dimensional Three complex wow. transignment theory. Complex yeah. transignment theory. Actually, yeah, holomorphic transignment theory sometimes also refers to omega wedge uh, uh, transignments form on a Calabiao threefold. It's a TQFT ish theory yeah. in dimension six. Yeah, in fact, that's some kind of stupid finite dimension example. Get algebraic manifold with closed one form, but which not differential with function. Okay, I, and I, then I, you get critical uh, zeros, so it will be, uh, it should go to universal cover and. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I'd love to hear more. I think I know what you're suggesting, and then that's a great idea. Yeah, you should you should tell me more. Yeah, that's indeed would be baby example. So that that's that's uh, probably in here. <laughs> okay. So now claim that I already said kind of implicitly a number of uh, times, uh, but. When you do resurgence in this context, you find something interesting. So first of all, you find, because you're resumming uh, each residue or each contribution in the trans series appears infinitely many times, this trans series coefficients n alpha beta are no longer integer. And in general, they're rational numbers, precisely by the phenomenon that you guys told me how to resum 1 plus 2 plus 3. Here, the typical thing that you encounter is 1 plus 0 plus minus 1 plus 1 plus 0 plus minus 1, like a circling um, periodic. Oh, is it really the <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> because suppose you do perturbative resummation at the critic of, of a perturbative series alpha, <laughs> labeled by alpha. Alpha is a critical point. Then anything else can contribute as a trans series. From what I tried to explain, each other critical point, just like alpha itself, is repeated infinitely many times with exactly the same value of Morse function. So what you get is, for example, if there is a trans series coefficient here originally just for one guy that is produced by Paul with residue plus one, what you get is infinite sum of one, 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 and so on. And that's exactly what you guys told me, how to regularize. So that's, first of all, you get this. But second thing is even more important, even though it feels less important uh, and more technical. So you find that <coughs> n alpha beta is not always n beta alpha up to a sign. And that's actually 
again, I don't know deeper reasons for this, but <laughs> I think that's what's important for this modularity and topological applications that I'm going to mention next. So in particular, it happens if alpha is non-degenerate or Morse critical point, namely expansion of uh, function uh, around this point is Gaussian, but beta is non-Gaussian. So in other words, degenerate. Okay. Can happen. Um, okay, from now on, it's probably fair to say that I'll stick most of the applications that I'm going to tell you in the rest of the talk uh, is to complex Chern Simons theory. But I encourage people to think about other contexts where this does happen. So Maxim is making really great suggestion. And uh, again, I don't know, that's, that's part of the original question why and when. I'm telling you just a little bit of why. I would love to have deeper conceptual understanding of this kind of phenomena. And also, I would like to know when. So in particular, is there a way to characterize in all classes of problems on a Borel plane when and how this happens? But the theorem is that, indeed, if, uh, so th 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 this is part of the statement that if beta is degenerate and alpha is non-degenerate, that's supposed to be always true. So that part has nothing to do with trans It has a flavor of mixed code structure because we have like filtration and then some Exactly, some exactly. Yeah. Only on some Yeah, way. yeah, yeah. I believe that there are exactly such several ways to, to, to look at the problem and basically what's happening here is that uh, degenerate guys try to be in their own grading more or less. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So to a naked eye or non-expert uh, in this field, again, the first statement of this theorem probably looks much more natural. The second looks like technical and non-interesting. But again, I want to emphasize that it's actually the second part which has more important corollary that I want to capitalize on in the rest of this talk. And it basically says that degenerate saddles are special. I want to. Pause. When you mention theorem, you mean what complexified No, no, no. Theorem in Not integral. <coughs> exponential integral. Exponential integral. Exponential integral. So, like I say, this theorem is, is more general. So, it, it was in the paper on complex transcendence, but argument applies just as well to any exponential integral. You really mean conjecture, right? No, I mean theorem. <laughs> you, you analyze exponential integral, you ask, how does. No, no, let's. <coughs> Let's not get too confused. The yeah. theorem is a proof. I mean, <laughs> 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 it's a good statement. It's a good statement. Yeah, yeah. statement is yeah that, that's a provable statement, and we can prove it for you. So, so what is the statement? So the statement is that if you start with exponential integral, right. and finite dimension, which in finite dimension? Uh, let, 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 let's start with finite dimensional. An application that we used was to infinite dimensional, but again, finite dimensional exponential integral. And perform uh, this kind of analysis, usual analysis of uh, Borel resummation where each critical point is replicated infinitely many times. And, um, uh, analyze what happens for de various types of degenerations, you indeed find the stratification uh, that more degenerate saddles don't get attached as a trans series to less degenerate ones. So that's the. Yeah. But before stating the thing, can you give one example of, of this? Um, Showing it's not the empty set. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it later. I, like I said, I, I wanted to start emphasizing phenomenon and, and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to examples. In fact, uh, I mean, in, in for example, if you say that this is, uh, you, I take any exponential integral with uh, ramifications, I will get something like this. Uh, well, I, I'm saying trigonometric type of integrable system. So start with system that has to do with spectral curve described by this equation a of x, y, where variables x and y are c star valued. Yeah, 
I claim that's going to be the case. I'm happy to walk you through this in detail. The example I was going to show through Chern Simons. I apologize, I didn't know what the request would be. Um, next time I'll prepare the right example. <laughs> it's hard to know what uh, uh, wishes are. But uh, I want to, again, emphasize the role of these degenerate saddles because for topological applications that's very important. And I want to, one way to say it is that the, again, these degenerate saddles are special. I want to put it even more strongly, I want to say that corollary of the statement is that uh, miracles happen. So this is surely a mathematical statement, right? <laughs> Stavros, you would probably agree with this. <laughs> For alpha degenerate. In the case of Chern Simons theory, and let me uh, leave, uh, leave uh, at the SL2 or uh, SU2 level, this means that alpha is basically a billion. So something which normally you would think is boring, or a billion, is playing a special role. And I want to explain uh, why and how in uh, the remaining part. So first, uh, it leads to a statement which uh, is that there is a three-dimensional topological quantum field theory in a mathematical sense of a T fluor of uh, a T Siegel, there is a functor, I'll call this functor Z hat, which associates to three manifolds a number, but so normally it would be called Z hat, value of the functor on a three manifold. <coughs> and uh, the point is that uh, as you can probably guess by now, that this number is, be, is going to be depend on Q, so Q is a parameter, but it's not just a random number that depends on Q. In other words, it's not just a function of Q, it's a natural Q series with integer powers, integer coefficients, which is perfectly convergent inside the unit disk, norm Q less than one. Okay? And in fact, in physics, so this is conjectural part, so that's actually where conjecture is. I want to be extremely clear. What's a statement? What's a theorem? What's a conjecture? This is conjectural. That this is expressed as graded earlier characteristic of some vector spaces. These are called spaces of BPS states, H, I, J. And therefore gives an explanation or breathes life into meaning of the integrality. Because once you see a Q-series with integer coefficients, you can naturally ask, what are these coefficients counting? And claim is that in this case, they're counting something concrete. Same kind of BPS states that you get in, say, black hole counting. <coughs> now, um, what is the formula? You didn't write it properly. That's uh, that's that's uh, some some physics thing. Uh, I suggest to. Is it, is it any group related to the story? Well, it's group independent. Uh, it's uh, l uh, basically for for every uh, complex group. You can label the series by either um, root systems such as SU, um, SU2, SU3, and so on, or by corresponding complexifications, say SL2C is actually the only example which is considered seriously in the literature. There are some statements about SLN, but um, um, yeah, that's, it, it, it's labeled by... If you don't say that you get really finite dimensional space for a surface, nothing like this. That, that's, that's right. So that's actually precisely the goal of, of this recent paper with Manalescu to ask is, what kind of TQFT it is. So in order to say it's a TQFT, you have to be able to cut and glue three manifolds along surfaces in any way. So you have to first of all define it for any closed and open manifold. And also you have to ask what kind of Hilbert space you associate to surface of genus G, for example. And uh, so it will be some Z hat of sigma G. So we only know the answer when genus is equal to one. I want to be completely clear, completely honest, what's known, what's done. Uh, this is good enough to build any three manifold because any three manifold can be obtained by surgery operations along genus one surfaces, but uh, it would be nice to extend this analysis to, uh, to, to, to higher genus. And this is indeed infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So the main technical ingredient in this work with Manalescu is to define taking the traces in this kind of TQFT. And once you're at it, I want to ask another question. Is it extended TQFT? 
can be extended further to higher categorical levels in the sense of a T and signal. I, I don't know the answer to it. So I want to be extremely clear about what's done and what's known and what's not. I mean, it's conjecture that it exists from physics, but that's a conjecture. But, but also the invariant for closed three manifold has an index, right? It has a... Oh, correct. Uh, yeah. So I, I didn't plan to, to say it explicitly, but in fact, it's exactly this same kind of degenerate uh, abelian saddle that labels this invariant. So it's actually decorated TQFT. So that will be precise statement. So in the world of TQFTs, there are so-called spin TQFTs defined on manifolds with additional structure. So it turns out that this label or this uh, degenerate saddles lead to uh, so-called spin C TQFT. You have to keep track of spin C structure and how it preserved under cutting and gluing. Again, that's getting a little technical. I'll be happy to discuss this or suggest to look at uh, this work with Manalescu just from a month ago or so for, for describing the Hilbert spaces and the invariance of closed three manifold. It's a finite sum. Huh? Which, what's the finest? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this dimension? No, no, the, the, this, this of course is infinite because it's, um, it, it's, it's a Q-series, so it has infinitely many terms. <laughs> It's confused because this dimension of this uh, cohomology space makes it will increase. Yeah, so they increase, but in each grading they're finite. So, so, <laughs> so another statement, which also is a conjecture, is that uh, dimension of, of, of the spaces is finite for each grading IG. Okay. In fact, um, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about it in a second. It's related to degenerate connections, yeah, of course, or not? Uh, it is, it is. So. Uh, it's, it's basically, the, the, right, so. Okay, I maybe, uh, I didn't plan to say too much about it, but again, since, since you guys asked. Uh, so what's, what's, what's the story here? So in entire, it's, it's like a research program. It's not even one paper or project. Um, in in whole research program in the past 20 years, I would say, with Kumran uh, Waffa, uh, Don Zagir, Tudun Dimofter, um, and uh, they, they decoupled, but then more recently, younger people like Pavel Putrov, Dupe, and others joined in. They were trying to look for, uh, say, a cell to C and Simons theory, which is a TQFT, so that you can A, compute things on general three manifolds. And we used all kinds of tools from either string theory and so on. And the point is that resurgence here was one ingredient which really helped. So, and that's what I'm trying to um, emphasize here by saying, by emphasizing this role of degenerate saddles. So if you perform uh, Borel resummation around degenerate abelian flat connections, what you get is this nice functor Z hat. So that's exactly what it is. It's Borel resummation or resurgence at abelian or degenerate flat connections. It's very well behaved for some miraculous reasons for TQFT purposes. In other words, it allows you to cut and glue. What could be done is uh, constructing various other functions. So for example, 20 years ago, we had vortex partition functions, which were also defined by using some other integration cycles in the Borel plane in, in this language. And these things uh, would be power series in variables such as q and x with integer coefficients on a face very similar. But this would not be a TQFT in a sense that we would not know how to take, say, partition function for not complement this vortex partition function and glue it in, namely cap it off. So we didn't know how to do surgeries. So it wouldn't be too QFT. Well, maybe just one question. Uh, if manifold is homologous, integer homology spheres, no, then it will be just perturbation series for trivial kind. Of exactly. Exactly. And actually, in that case, it reproduced uh, some of the experimental results by Hikami, Zagir, and in special cases where it's Poincaré sphere or Breeze Corn spheres. So it gave kind of physical meaning or Donaldson Thomas type meaning in terms of BPS states of what, what was happening before. So, in fact, these were pioneers of it. <coughs> For example, you can do resurgence around various other flat connections, which are 
non-degenerate. For example, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a picture which um, sometimes uh, which has several branches, and one of them is sometimes called conjugate. This is opposite of hyperbolic branch. <coughs> In that case, you can do this Borel resummation resurgence. You start with a perturbative series, you resum it, and you obtain a partition function which uh, we suspected, and now a couple of weeks ago we verified very carefully in precise cal calculations with Don Zagir, that you do get a function of Q, which is exactly partition function of anderson uh theory. Uh, but this, uh, this is much better behaved object. Again, we still don't know how to cap it off, as far as I understand, so how to do surgeries. But it's not of the form where it's a power series in Q and X with integer coefficients. It's just a function. So in many attempts that, that we had over the past 20 years, we had various variants of this. But until this role of degenerate settles was realized, we could never get a TQFT. And claim is that this thing is a full TQFT, at least at the top level. So you can do it for three manifolds with any surgery operations you want. Now. <coughs> Better yet, uh, since you... The, the, the Zeichmuller Muller guy, it depends on X as well, right? Or is that, is that what you mean for an X? Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Q. It, it yeah, does it depend. Q. Uh, I guess it's a Q and X also. Mm -hmm. yeah. But okay, yeah. you suppress X. So. Left hand side uh, is only a function of Q. Yes. Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, 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 so, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. That's, that's what I meant. Yeah, sorry. I had a ton. Yeah, R right and left hand side didn't agree. Anyway. So here is another conjecture. So again, separating theorems from conjectures. So I'll call it a 3D modularity conjecture, since it appears in the paper under the same name, 3D modularity. That another miracle happens for, for this resurgence of degenerate saddles, abelian connections, uh, namely this invariant Z hat for any three manifold as a function of Q, and possibly x if it has boundary, is in fact a character of logarithmic vertex operator algebra. So not only this BPS dimensions, this HBPS is infinite dimensional graded vector space, it's a module of a vertex operator algebra. And therefore, this series has some modular properties of the type that logarithmic VOA people encounter. These are not usual modular properties. That's, that's why the logarithmic. These are spoiled modular properties of the type that Ramanujan found. So these are mock, higher depth mock, and even less modular objects. <coughs> there are deeper and interesting reasons for this coming from representation theory, because uh, representations, uh, representation category of log VOAs is not semi-simple, and that's responsible for the spoiled modularity properties. But I want to point out that for uh, purposes of topology, these degenerate saddles are cool because uh, they produce something that behaves nice on the cutting and gluing. And I hope you agree with me that this cutting and gluing seems to be very far from degenerate versus non-degenerate. I don't know how to relate them directly. I only see that there is a correspondence. There seems to be some effect on whether we perform resurgence around degenerate saddles on whether the result is going to be TQFT. And here, there is analogous factory of modular-like objects, which are interesting for studying modular properties. For example, the one I showed you in the very beginning is an example of that. So that's precisely that kind of thing. It's a series in Q, so it's chiral. <coughs> uh, it's, it's a series in Q, so it's chiral. Yeah, it's totally chiral. And that's why it's just VOA, not, not full CFT. Yeah. OK, so I promised you to show how to do calculations. So I want to end. So there were many questions, and we started late. Can I have five minutes? Well, you have five minutes. Oh, OK, I have five minutes. That's <laughs> thank you. So I want to show you how to compute things. And also, if I get a chance, give you another homework. So one homework has helped me recognize this Q series, which I showed in the beginning. It's not a joke. I have no idea how to. Um, um, how to identify it. Yeah, uh, be before we get to the picture, I want to write a couple of formulae. So, uh,
<laughs> what are we going to compute? So first of all, uh, from what I just said, uh, hopefully you see it, or if, if not, uh, you can uh, ask me later, uh, look up the details, it's, it's all written up. So let's try to compute the starting point of the complex trans-Simons theory around some flat connection. So again, key will be to use uh, not complements because again, you can get any three manifold by doing surgeries on arbitrary knots. So therefore, understanding theory for not complements is obviously one important but not the most important step. And here, I'll go back to something I did uh, 20 years ago or almost 20 years ago, um, is constructing perturbative um, series uh, of H bar on a knot complement S3 minus K. So at that point, the conjecture was that as a function of H bar and variable X, you can either do this using WKB approximation, or if you have a curve A of XY equals zero, which in that case is a polynomial, it may have many branches as a curve over C plane uh, parameterized by X. So you could have all kinds of branches. <coughs> so one of them is usually called geometric. There is a conjugate branch. That's the one related to anderson kashaya <coughs> theory. There is a billion one, which is what we're going to be interested in. And there could be lots of other ones in the middle. <coughs> Suppose you fix X and you want to compute perturbative partition function of complex transignments at some branch here in the neighborhood of, of this value of X that you fix as a function of H bar. So claim is that it's annihilated by operator A hat, which is produced by quantizing the A polynomial curve. So it's a very simple Q difference equation, which then allows you to solve. So all these choices of, of branches are precisely these choices that we call alpha. So alpha is either one or two or three, depending how many of them you have. And on each of them, you can solve this Q difference equation perturbatively in H bar. That's something very concrete, something explicit. And what you get is that it's of the form that we already saw earlier today, one over H bar as zero on a branch alpha as a function of X plus S1 on a branch alpha as a function of X plus H bar S2 on a branch alpha as a function of X and so on. So you do it perturbatively. Okay, <coughs> so what we want to do, it's already a function of X and perturbative thing of H bar. So that's very computable. I'll show you this computations in a second. But what we want to do is we want to perform this resurgence and as we described all along, transfer information from the main near Q equals one where H bar is equal to zero to write it as a series in Q. So what we really want to do is exponentiate this and resum in such a way that that's the sum over m, fm of q times x to the m. So we want to present this as a function of x and q, or ideally series in both. So, so that's going to be z hat of, of a not complement. Huh? X belongs to C star. Yeah, yeah, x belongs to C star. Yeah. And, and that curve, sorry, this curve, a of x, y is on c star cross c star. So that's, that's, that's crucial for, for what's happening. So <coughs> there is something we did. Uh, th 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 exactly this was implemented in this paper with uh, Tudor Dimofta, Don Zagir, Jonathan Lennels. And the paper is called Exact Results in Complex Trans-Simons Theory. Exact because we can do it to any order in H bar. So you can solve this easily on any branch to any order in H bar. So we saw no obstacle and that's why we called it exact results. But we didn't know what to do with this because it's only perturbative. So that's why perturbative is part of the title because at that time we didn't know what to do with this wealth of information of computing these coefficients to any order in H bar. But now we do. So anyway, I'll scroll down where I show how we did these calculations. And I embarrass myself by pointing out that we missed something obvious and cool. 
So where is it? Yeah, so that's this uh, Q difference equation. Uh, here x and y are called L and M. So in the case of, say, figure 8 naught, this is one of the branches called geometric. So we s compute this S1, S2, and so on. This is another branch called conjugate. Uh, two minutes. And this is the abelian branch. So we have all this data for functions as 0, S1, S2 of x. So what did we do? Again, this was 10 years ago. In fact, we just had a 10-year anniversary of this paper. Uh, but we missed something completely obvious. And I want to again embarrass myself by, by showing you this. We take just that result from old days. And again, something really special happens for this degenerate or abelian connection. And I want you to see it by your own eyes. We open the exponential. We basically take that old result, no new computations. That's what we did in the paper with cheap print. Just exponentiate it, and you get at each order in each bar some function of x, which has development to positive and negative powers. Let's not worry about x dependence for a second. So focus your attention on just fixed power of x. Pick x to the 1 half, for example. And ask yourself, do I see anything? I'm embarrassed to say we didn't. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a calculation that a high school student should be able to do. You shouldn't wait 10 years to do it. So, and, and this is the magic, the kind of integrality that appears right in front of your eyes. You see a bunch of rational numbers here. These are Gromov-Witten coefficients of something. Or you can interpret this as uh, in many different ways. But fo fo focus your attention on x to the half. Can you tell me what this function f of m is in that case? Exponent of h bar. In other words, it's q. So therefore, you're telling me that f1 half, or let, let me call it f1 in this notation, uh, is, is just q. How about uh, next thing? So here, um, notations are such that uh, only odd values of m appear. And powers of x are these odd values divided by 2. So next step is uh, going to be f3 of q. So what is the value of f3? No. <laughs> Zero. There is no term f to the uh, x to the 3 halves. So what about f5? That's q squared. Uh, I trust you, but see, I'm on the spot giving this talk, so therefore I, I, <laughs> I want to double check. Yes, you're, you're much better than me. It's Q squared. What about uh, 7? Very good. And so on. So in fact, there is a very nice closed form, which uh, Maxim at this point should recognize. So this is the last equation I'm going to write and stop. So I don't want to upset the chair. <laughs> This is definitely not something I want to do, but uh, I want to say that, that uh, what this function is, really is, it's, uh, um, so what you get is fm here is epsilon m times q to the m square minus uh, plus 23 divided by 24, so up to factor of q, this is m squared minus 1 over 24, where epsilon m are either plus 1 if m is equal to 5 or 7 mod 12, minus 1 if it's uh, 1 or 11 mod 12, or 0 otherwise. So that's how integers and q series appear out of nothing, out of thin air. And hopefully this is nice present to Maxime because this is Kansevich the gear function in the original trefoil, but now we can compute comp 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 it for any node, basically. Thank you. Sorry for running over time. <laughs> Questions? I have a question. Yes, if you are interested in, in divergent Q series, of course, you can suppose that Q is nearby 1, and you can look at resolvent in H bar. But uh, why not look uh, directly with at, uh, Q resolvent? There is a perfect Q analog of, uh, of resolvent with uh, 
similaire pour les cas de chirurgie, with Q, 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 Q alien delivery, so then uh, all sorts of things, Q stands for them. I would love to, to, to look that yeah, if, yeah, if anyone, so thank you for bringing it up. Uh, I definitely want to learn more from you. Like I say, I'm user and probably a very bad user of resurgence. So I would love to explore more. Um, and then the only thing I want to say is that uh, what's happening here is that this thing is given uh, to us just as a function of each bar. So, but, but if there is a way to, to produce, so that's the goal, to produce Q out of it. I would love to learn how... At the end, you have a Q series. Right. Where you have a Q series, you can apply the Q, Q to it. Well, once I have a Q series, I'm done. I, I just go home at that point. I, I don't need anything. I mean, the, the whole goal is to turn H bar expansion into Q expansion. So that's, that's at least application. But I would love to hear, if, if, even if it's not directly relevant to solving this problem. Just one comment. What is called Q difference equations is not the same as in these Q difference equations because in those Q is varying, it's not fixed. Q is e to the h bar. Yes, it's similar to the So, so it's not like Q pan Lebesgue where Q is 0 0.9. Q itself varies yeah, with it's respect to range. It's a parameter, but it could be 0 0.9. So at least in the unit disk, every, yeah, exactly. So this is what I thought people call parametric resurgence. And I want to learn this too. So again, please come and teach me parametric resurgence, because this is very relevant. Yeah. And maybe just some yeah. result. When you have this channel sense defined up integer, uh, the natural six is just to make generic series of partition functional three manifolds on the level. Yeah, and the six should yeah. have parallelly many single row points, which will be the right. of diagrams and get infinite monogram. Yeah, but actually, that's a cool thing. Some people looked at it, and it does appear even as one of the versions that I mentioned in physics. But I don't know how it's related to this. So, yeah, do do you know by any chance? It, it should be it should be closely connected. I tried to compare details, for example, for concrete examples, and it wasn't entirely obvious. So I'd be glad to to explore it because, in some sense, um, yeah. I, anyway, I. I yeah, yeah. <coughs> it's a, co a comment that, in, in fact, you, you're, you're taking resurgence at h bar equals zero, and you're trying to get out analytical information at h bar equal infinity. And I just would like to comment that when you do the resurgence, quantum resurgence of the Schrodinger equation, that can be done. That is, uh, there is a definite way uh, to the resurgent information at h bar equals zero is sufficient to gain very uh, complete control at h bar equal infinity. Yeah, that's that's why I, I love resurgence. That, that, that's why I when I discovered this, I think it's a magic tool from 21st century. I don't know why it works, but <laughs> yeah, Marcus. Yeah, so here you're not really using resurgence. You're doing a partial resumation of your series. And actually, I have to comment that this can this can be done in w, in many general contexts of WPV of quantum curves. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, I, I think. Uh, this is, in a sense, the analog of these refined BPS invariants for quantum curve, quantum mirror curves. So it's the analog of this. Yeah. And actually, uh, we, when we were doing calculations of quantum mirror curves, we actually had to do a similar resumation. So you get something like, of course, you get something like a Q function, functions of Q with coefficients in X. Right. So this is this is probably a very general phenomenon for any WKB expansion of a quantum mirror of a quantum. Curve. But I think it has to be trigonometric. I think, it in, in a sense, it has to be C star cross C star. That's why I was trying to sell it like that. We are in quantum yeah. mirror curves, yeah. which, are, which are exponential. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I guess it's more, I, mean, I think uh, this, can, this has been observed for also in. Right, right. That's, that's why we were writing this paper. I want to point out that that example I gave was, of course, something that you can see with the naked eye. I mean, this resumming to exponential of h bar. But for example, this is answer for figure eight, for which I didn't have time. And if you go to other knots, then you really need resurgence. To resum h bar to the n over n factorial, you don't need resurgence. So that's, that's clear. But in other cases, you really do. So uh, in that sense, don't, don't take me wrong that, that this is that, that can, is, is easier. So that, that's, that's why I still want to learn from all of you resurgent techniques. If you use this the idea of the tetrahedral decomposition, to the paper, do, do you see it just immediately? Uh, first of all, you see, yeah, you, you can compute in many states some models this kind of uh, asymptotics. 
but uh, I don't know how to make it in a full TQFT, in a sense, do surgeries. So that's what I was trying to emphasize. Uh, in fact, physics makes predictions for which things should be TQFT and should not. So therefore, some of them, I think, have no hope. But for example, Anderson Kashaev is very special in that sense because it's lowest point in the Morse function. And that actually also has nice properties. So it could be analogous statement that that one is special. But so anyway, I think that that's the only TQFT which I know. So there is something definitely going on between degenerate versus cutting and gluing. Um, as you know, there is a relation between complex churn Simons theory and four-dimensional flux simulated supersymmetric twisted <coughs> super young Niels theory. So, um, did you think the implications of these uh, degenerate saddles uh, from that point of view, of, or this general story from that point of view? Uh, we tried uh, with Ciprian and uh, even at early stages of our project, there was a paper trying to analyze those moduli spaces, which claim something that even contradicts uh, what we naively thought. So uh, I, I'm happy to discuss it further, but um, I, I, I don't can I can say much because these moduli spaces are really complicated. So there. That's, that's, in a sense, a uh, difference between working in a phase space and a Borel plane. In a phase space, you have to work with very singular spaces which are non-compact, and you have infinitely many homology cycles. Again, that's, that's really what you're dealing with. On the Borel plane, you're just summing numbers, so it's more easier to, to, to deal with. And, and here you have very stacky behavior, which again, I don't know how to compare it. That's a great question. I think it would be very important to develop it, but it's way above my pay grade. So, if there's no further questions, let's uh, thanks everyone.